Hey everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, I am taking a look at The Landing, Gallipoli 1915, designed by Joe Schmidt, published by Catastrophe Games. The Landing, as you can probably guess from the name, focuses on the initial beach landings at what became known as Anzac Cove on April 25th, 1915. You play as the mixed allied force composed of Australians, um, New Zealand troops, and Indian troops. The game tells a story of their ordeal, trying to secure the heights overlooking the landing beach. Your opponent is the Ottoman troops and sergeant, handled by the game system. The landing is a light, card-based game with a focus on pushing your luck. Your troops attempt to advance from terrain card to terrain card, fighting the Ottoman defenders along the way. If you advance all the way to the end, you have to face um, the Ottomans and their sergeant. And unlike the Allies historically, if you claim the heights, you claim victory. Luck is a huge part of the game. You need to use the few cards you have wisely to offset some of that luck. Now let's do a quick overview of how the game works. I have a tutorial playthrough for an in-depth look at the game. Um, I'll cover my pros and cons, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, so I have the game um, set up right now with the initial setup. The game is played over three rounds, a dawn, noon, and dusk round, which in e within each of those rounds, you have four turns. During each turn, there's going to be multiple phases. Um, a turn is going to be made up of the Anzac phase, which is your phase, right? When you get to take an action. Um, actually, you get to take three actions during each of your turns. There'll be an Ottoman phase, which you will flip over an Ottoman card, resolve it. There'll be a close combat phase, which occurs if there are your soldiers in the same terrain card as Ottoman soldiers. And then finally, the game has a journal phase, Phase, which is kind of a unique opportunity to either write down something or simply reflect on what has been happening in your game and how it looks historically. So as you start, you have your troops. You can see, and like I said, I have it all set up over here on this boats card. Now each card, tra uh, train card, and by the way, these are set up, the boats and the beach every game. However, the rest of them are randomized. There's some additional train cards. So you never know exactly what terrain... Um, you're going to be seeing in your game. You start off, again, in at dawn round, first turn. You have your men here in the boats. You're going to be landing them on the beach. So during your turn, you'll have a hand of four cards from these operation cards. In addition, you have two actions you can take that you can choose from. You have three actions you can take, excuse me, but two options to choose from. They are to either advance or to rally. Rally, like most war games, your units are going to have a fresh side and then they're going to have an unnerved side with the stripe on it. Basically, again, just like a lot of war games, start this is going to be considered full strength. If you take a hit, you go to the unnerved side. If they take another hit, they're going to be eliminated from the game. So you can rally your soldiers and then the core of the game will be advancing. You'll be advancing them from terrain card to terrain card. Once you're at a certain terrain card, say you're in the beach here, and we want to advance to the next terrain card. We're declaring our advance, so you're committing to it, because we don't know what the terrain is until we kind of get there. You flip it over, and it's going to have a couple things on here. So this card is Battleship Hill. It has some iconography, and it has some text at the bottom. The text is historical flavor text, right? So it says, Battleship Hill. Initially Big 700, it served as a target for the British naval salvos. Also, the two really important things, though, for the gameplay... Is the top right. For every brown square in the top right, you're going to add an Ottoman counter to that card. And the top left, that is the cost basically for the movement for that terrain. So the game resolves around 1d6s. So when you're rolling a 1d6 for advance, you're going to subtract that terrain marker from whatever number you have. And then whatever number is left over, that's how many troops you'll be able to advance into that card. Like I said, you're going to continue moving from card to card. Eventually, you'll get reinforcements. You'll get the Auckland Battalion. You'll get these New Zealand troops that'll land on the beach. And you can go ahead and join you. The New Zealand and Australian troops together have an advantage when advancing, so it works more to your favor to keep them together and move them. Um, again, you run through the turn, the sequence of play. You get to take multiple actions. The game will go ahead, flip a card. It'll tell you something like, oh, rifle fire. Roll one die, plus one extra die per active Ottoman token. So say if there was an Ottoman here, you know, that'd be two dice. Each result of four plus deals one stress. The game has hits and it has stress. 
hits go to whoever you want to assign it to. Stress has to go to your Lance Corporal first, which you can see he has a number um, three, two, one, and has says spirit. Hits to his stress are going to reduce his spirit. Once that's at zero, he is eliminated from the game, and any stress becomes converts into hits and has to go against your soldiers. How do you win the game? Simple, sometimes not so simple. You have to advance your men all the way to the last terrain card. When you get to the last terrain card, you'll flip it over. However many Ottoman soldiers it tells you to put on there, if it does. So in this case, say it would be two. You go ahead and put them on there. And the Ottoman sergeant, you put him on there. You can notice, he, much like your Lance Corporal, he has three spirit. So he takes three hits. So whatever many hits he has, or many hits you have to do to eliminate the Ottoman forces, by the very last turn of the game, you have to be standing at that last terrain card without any Ottoman forces, if there are any left. Basically, you simulate what historically happened, which is allies got bogged down and ended up reverting to trench warfare. So see if you can do better than history. All right, let's go ahead and jump into my pros and cons. All right, as usual with my reviews, cons first. First con, you know, luck is at the core of the game here. It's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you guys know I love rolling dice, but I do wish there was more luck mitigation. There's a little bit, um, primarily in choosing, you know, what card you want to play that turn, and then the ability to discard whatever card that you had played and instead allow you to re-roll one of your dice. That is a big saving grace alone. Even just that discard to re-roll a die is a huge saving grace because otherwise you find literally every action you're taking it for you and for them, although there's really no way to mitigate the luck with the Ottoman die roll, but everything you're doing, you're rolling a 1d6. So if you're trying to advance, if you have a few poor rolls, and because there's a limited amount of turns in the game, right, you only have the three, um, the three phases, excuse me, three rounds, excuse me, three rounds and four turns, if you have a, a run of bad dice rolling, it's game over because you're not going to be able to advance quick enough to make it to the end. Um, second con, the rule book. While very short, it it's actually kind of confusing in parts. Now, there is an updated rule book you can download, which I highly suggest you do that. It has some clarifications. Overall, it adds maybe half a page. I found it completely necessary, though, because it just adds some, some clarification on cards, some things that if I had not read it in the updated rule book, I wouldn't even realize I could do with some of the cards. Now, it doesn't clarify everything. And, you know, it's not really a rattle. Like I said, it's just it just has more explanations. I just feel like it's a missed opportunity. The rule book, as simple as it is, and I don't know if that was the goal, as they said, hey, the rule book is like, like, it comes with the game, I think it's two pages. I think the updated one is three, approximately. I feel like maybe they could have just said, you know what, let's commit to having more than two pages. You know, maybe start with three, maybe four even, to have clarifications, you know, to really define what you can and can't do each turn with your cards. Are you playing them and then holding them and then you can discard them? Is it, are you playing them and then you're using them right away? So can, can you, you do have, and by the way, with the rules, you have to play a card every one you have four cards to start your turn. You have to play one card every turn because there's bad cards, the sphere card you have to play, which is fine, but maybe they could have said, Hey, you don't, you know, you can wait to play your card to the end of your actions. You have to play it right away. I assume you do, but it doesn't clarify, etc. All right, now for my pros. So the designer, Joe Schmidt, you know, he's made sure to sprinkle history throughout the game. I'm especially fond of the flavor text on the cards that give you backstory on the units involved and the terrain fought over. You know, whether it's the text on the Auckland Battalion card, the text here on your, you know, Strength Love Battalion, your Lance Corporal card. Like I, I mentioned before, all the text on the terrain cards. When you flip them over, there's text on the bottom. Mule Gully, why is it called that? The beloved mule was vital to the supply lines that cross this gully. Like, that's awesome. I love that. I love that history, you know. Having that in there is great to me. Um, second pro, the artwork. It's really grown on me. You know, it's simple. Absolutely, it's simple. But I enjoy the clean look. You know, and everything ties together. There's nothing that clashes. So when you're, you're moving your, you know, your troops and you're flipping cards over, everything is clear, easy to read. You know exactly how many Ottoman counters to put, what the terrain cost is, you know, it just looks very clean, very nice. Um, maybe could have had, you know, a picture on the cards as opposed to just having, you know, the Union Jack here and then 
what I assume is the Ottoman, something from the Ottoman flag here, you know, a crescent. I, I don't know. Um, maybe could add a little something on there. Overall, though, that's, that's kind of a minor complaint. Um, um, third con, the game is quick to learn and play. You know, criticisms of the rulebook aside, and it deserves a little bit, this is the type of game you can unbox, you can read the rulebook, which, like I said, is two to three pages, but download the updated one, set it up, and be playing all within probably an hour. You know, and once you play through a couple games, you get used to the round turn action structure, you'll be flying through your games. I found myself playing multiple games in a row, one after the other. All right, my final thoughts. The Landing, Gallipoli 1915, is a small game. You know, there's only a handful of counters. It's only a couple dozen cards. There's only a limited number of train tiles. And card events aside, you only have two options to choose from each turn. That said, simply put, the landing does a lot with a little. If you are interested in the history and you want a light, quick playing historical game, I encourage you to check this one out. I also recommend that you take the time to read the designer notes. Joe Schmidt has written a very moving piece on the history that this game covers. Read the little notes, the historical facts on the cards, you know, read all those things. And while I know most people aren't going to stop and actually write anything down during the journal phase of the game, I believe that is a great time to pause, take a deep breath, take stock of your game. Imagine for a second who those counters represent, the men on both sides who fought and died in this conflict. A conflict that, before I played the game, I knew very little about, almost nothing. My fault, you know, I love history, but I haven't read everything. You know, and as an American, it's not something you're necessarily going to learn a lot about. But because I picked up this game, you know, I, I started reading, I read what the designer had to write, I learned from that, and then I found myself watching videos on YouTube, you know, looking up more information online. I learned a lot more about the conflict than I had ever even known. Now, is the gameplay particularly deep? No, it's not. But the history behind it is. And I'm really glad Joe Schmidt and Catastrophe Games took the time and energy to share it with us. I hope you guys enjoyed my overview and review. I hope you guys enjoyed my other videos on the game. Let me know below if you've played it, you're thinking about play it, if I've convinced you to play it, or if I've explained some things that make you say, nah, I don't think so. Either way, let me know below. And as always, if you made it this far, please give the video a like, you know, thumbs up, and subscribe if you haven't. Otherwise, guys, thank you, and until next time, later.